Hey guys, Justin here with JR at Model Works, and today's video is all about the interior. We've got some modifications to do on the back seat, some interior prep, we've got to be painting the wood grain, we'll be modifying the dash for some gauges from Best Model Car Parts, we're going to be replacing the steering wheel and modifying the steering column and a whole lot more. So let's go ahead and get this camera flipped around and get to work. Alright guys, we have some really cool seats from Black Box STL we want to use, and they come with a rear seat to match the fronts. Now I've already started on the interior, I started on it before I realized these even existed, but I really want to use these rear seats. The problem is, this hump in the center that's molded into the back seat keeps our printed seats from sitting flat. Now in theory, the correct way to do this would be to go in and cut out the entire seat and fit and scale these 3D parts to fit, but I don't really want to do all that and I don't want to have to fight with making sure we don't cause any fit issues between the interior tub and the chassis. So we're going to come in with a Dremel and a sanding wheel and we're going to sand this all out smooth for a flush fit. Will it work? I don't know, but we're about to find out. We're going to put down some masking tape to act as a rough guide for where we want to be. We're also going to mask off the interior detail to prevent any damage in case we slip or hit something with the Dremel, because we do not want to damage any of this interior detail. We're just going to come in with the Dremel and gently work back and forth, slowly taking out the excess material. We don't want to press too hard, as that'll actually cause it to melt the material instead of sanding it. Once we have it sanded down, we'll come back in with a chisel and we're going to scrape away any excess material. Sometimes the Dremel leaves little bits on the edges and this will get us nice and smooth. Now we're just going to repeat that process to take out the bottom portion of the seat as well. Again, we're going to come in with the chisel to remove any excess material from the Dremel, but then we also want to use it to carve away the material where the two sides of the seat meet that the Dremel couldn't reach. We're going to cut this area down and get it nice and flush as well. Now there is some raised piping detail still on this back that I don't think is going to look real well, so we're going to mask this off and remove it with a sander. Now just a quick test fit, everything looks like it's going to fit really nice, and with that piping detail removed, this just looks like a raised ridge on that parcel shelf that meets up to the back of the seat. Our door cards have these molded in window cranks, which we're going to be replacing, so we're going to start by cutting them off with our nippers. We're then going to use our dead center tool to create a pilot hole right in the center where that crank should meet the door. And we'll come back in with a pin vise and a 0.6 millimeter drill bit to drill our hole. Once we have the hole drilled, we'll come back in with a chisel and remove any of the existing raised detail. And then we'll sand it smooth with a sander. Now we can't reach the window cranks in the back seat with the nippers, so we're just going to chisel them out. Again, we'll use our dead center tool to form a pilot hole, but since we're adding that rear seat and it's going to add a little bit of thickness, we're going to raise the rear window crank up just a little bit. One of the nice things about using the PCB bits, we can't really get a pin vise in here, but you can grip them with your finger and twist them to form a hole. Then using a pin vise, we'll use that hole to fully drill out the hole from the outside. We have our parts in primer and now we want to start on the wood grain. Now I've base coated the wood areas in some Tamiya Chocolate Milk or LP59 NATO Brown for those of you who want the specifics. And now we're going to use some Tamiya Acrylic Buff in flat black. Using our 0.3mm mechanical pencil we're going to dip the lead into our buff paint and then use it to draw some fine lines over the brown. Now it takes a while to do this as you can only do a little bit at a time before you have to reload the pencil, but this really gets a much finer line than I've ever gotten with a paintbrush. 
Now because this is such a long process, to keep this video somewhat short, I have sped up most of the wood painting process up to about three times normal speed. With our highlights done, we're going to come in with our flat black and we're going to do the same thing. Make sure we hit some different areas, but we're going to come in and just put in some small black lines in here. These are going to give us some darker areas. It's going to give us a lot of depth and texture. We've moved into the spray booth and this is where the magic happens. Because we want a darker reddish mahogany tone, we're going to start with some LP52 Clear Red. Now we're not just going to pull way back on this trigger and go crazy with the cheese whiz here. We're going to just barely touch the trigger, just enough to get some paint to start to flow. The goal here is super light misting. If you hose this on wet, it will ruin the look. If you wanted to go for a lighter wood, you could go straight to the clear orange. Or if you wanted to go for a really pale wood like pine, use a lighter base than the NATO brown, do more highlight, and go with clear yellow instead. Now to get our final color, we're going to do a couple of light coats of LP53 clear orange. Not a lot, just one, two, maybe three super light mist coats. Keep an eye on the color tone until you get a nice golden rich woody brown. Here we are just coming in for a second nice even coating. Now as you can see, even doing really light mist coats, this came out way too glossy. So we're going to hit this with two, maybe three coats of Mr. Hobby GX113 Flat Clear. Part of the reason it came out too glossy is because I pre-thin my clear orange with Tamiya's Lacquer Thinner with Retarder, so it self-levels. I do that because I also use that clear orange for turn signals. We're just going to go in, light even mist coats, and it's eventually going to dry out in a nice flat wood-like finish. Unmasking a paint job is kind of like opening Christmas presents. Did we get the good stuff or did we get a bunch of bleed through? Looks like we got the good stuff. Our kit does not come with any gauge decals, but that's okay because we have some aftermarket gauges from Best Model Car Parts. Of course, rather than just cutting these out and gluing them into the dash like a normal person, I'm going to do it the hard way, starting with drilling out all of our gauges. We're going to start by drilling a fairly small hole in each one, and then we're going to step up to pretty much the largest bit I have, which is a 3mm bit. The gauges are larger than 3 millimeters. For the smaller gauges, it's fairly close, so we're just going to use a round metal file and file out the rest of the existing gauge face. The speedometer is significantly larger, so we're going to start by taking a small metal grinding bit in a cordless rotary tool to cut out the rest of the existing face, and then we'll clean that up with the metal file as well. The 
Now the back of the gauges is fairly uneven, so we're going to come in with a 120 grit sanding stick and we're going to sand this smooth to even it up. This next part is kind of tricky. The bottom of the speedo isn't on the same level as the rest of the gauges. So using a sanding wheel, we want to trim out the bottom area so that there's a lip around the speedo that is flush with the other gauges, but we don't want to go too far and cut through either the front or the bottom of the dashboard. Next, using some masking tape, we're going to make a template of our gauge area. We're then going to take that template and we're going to transfer it over to a really thin sheet of acetate. Once we have that cut down, we're going to check our fit, and then we'll tape that into place. Now the bottom sections of our dash need to be black, so we hit it with some black primer, and that's going to give us a perfect template for where we need to place our gauges. We're then going to pack the bottom sections of the dash with some blue tack before we spray the whole thing in gray primer and then do the wood grain effect on the dashboard. Apparently, somewhere along the way, I lost some footage, so here's what we did. We took the clear piece of acetate that we used to make our template, and we copied it to another sheet. This sheet remains perfectly clear, and we're going to glue this in right now using some Bondic. We're just going to apply some of the UV glue all along this face, wipe it to get it kind of smooth with that toothpick, and set the clear piece of acetate into position, and then we will cure that into place with the UV light. This is a separate piece. This is not the piece we made earlier that has all of our circles on it. We're going to start with a couple of quick bursts with the light just to kind of tack the clear part into place. And then we'll come back and we'll do a real good curing with the UV light after. That is going to create our clear lens face. These are the gauges from Best Model Car Parts. They are beautifully printed on thick, glossy photo paper. I think he only sells them on eBay, so I'll put a link to his eBay shop in the description below. He has gauges for a lot of, if not all, the major AMT, Ravel, and Monogram kits, and they're really cheap. What wasn't cheap was this punch from Micromark, but it does a fantastic job of punching these out, so my inner tool whore, as Will Pattison calls it, had to have one. You just line up the gauge with the hole that fits it best, place the clear plate over the metal plate, insert the metal punch, and then hit it with a small mallet or hammer, and you have perfectly punched gauges. We're using some Bob Smith Super Gold Plus CA glue on a toothpick to place a tiny drop of clear safe CA on the acetate sheet with our gauge template, and then we're gonna set our gauges in place over the black circles one at a time. Sorry for being out of frame on this one. We are using the Bob Smith Super Gold Plus again, and we're going to glue the acetate sheet with our gauges to the back of our dash as well, just like we did with the first clear sheet. 
and now we have a really nice set of gauges in our dashboard. The decal set also comes with a really nice radio face for the tuning dial, which we're going to glue in with a little bit of CA glue. And I think that these are AC controls that go into the black space on the other side of the dash as well. I also added some photo etch metal trim rings around the gauge openings. This is something I really wish I hadn't done as they don't fit very well at all. But once I had the first one on and realized they weren't going to fit right, it was too late. Trying to remove these would result in messing up the wood grain, and I cannot even think about trying to start this whole dash over at this point, as a lot of things like those gauges are already glued in place. The speedo ring is too small, and it fit, slides down inside the gauge opening. The smaller ones for the other four gauges are too large, and they overlap. It doesn't look terrible but it could be nicer if they fit a little more accurately. With all of that done, it's time to add a little CA glue to this lip that runs around the back side of the dash. Using a toothpick, we're gonna to spread that nice and thin so it doesn't ooze out around the edges. And then we can carefully set the top of our dashboard into place. And for a little extra reinforcement, we're gonna add some CA glue to the inside of the seam. Other than a little detail painting, our dash is wrapped up. Next up, we're going to modify the steering wheel and the steering column. My regular viewers will know I often use Top Studio 1.2 millimeter rivets for my ignition switch, but I've always felt 1.2 is just a little too small. So I have 3D designed and printed up my own ignition switch. I think I printed these up at like two millimeters, which may be just slightly too large. But next time I'll try printing them between 1.5 and 1.8. I really think 1.8 millimeters would be the perfect fit. You guessed it, we're going to start with our dead center tool to form a pilot hole, and then we're going to use a 0.6 millimeter drill bit to drill a hole for our mounting post. Our steering column does not have any form of turn signal stock on it at all, so we're going to make one using a number one insect pin. The little ball at the end is a little big. We're going to wrap the pin in some tape, which will sort of hold enough to fit it into our drill. Then we're going to use a sander to try and sand away the sides of the plastic ball, changing it from a round ball to more of a cylindrical tip. It looks like the insect pin is 0.3 millimeters in diameter, so we're going to drill a 0.4 millimeter hole in the left side of the steering column. Now we want to measure and position the pin where we want it to end and mark where it meets the column. And using that mark, we're going to put a bend in it so that it roughly follows the angle of the steering wheel. And then we're going to cut it, leaving it a little bit long so that we can glue it into the steering column. When we do cut it, we want to make sure we hold it so that end doesn't fly off anywhere. During the embossing, I made no secret of the fact that I was not a fan of the kit steering wheel. I have 3D printed a Momo drift style wheel that looks much nicer. So first order of business is to wrap some tape around the steering column and chuck it into our drill. And then we're going to use a JLC razor saw to cut off the original wheel. I really like this saw. The blade is really thin and it makes super clean, thin cuts. The steering column is wider than the mounting collet for the Momo wheel. To make this look nicer, I'm going to take a metal file and file an angled bevel into the end of the steering column. This is gonna give us a cleaner fit. When I printed the steering wheel, I added a small mounting post in the center of the collet. We're going to drill a matching hole in the center of the steering column to hold it in place. We have everything painted up, so we're gonna snap one of these ignition switches off. We're gonna stick it onto a toothpick that's got some Tamiya tape wrapped backwards around it so it's sticky side out. We're gonna dip it into a little bit of CA glue and carefully slide it into the hole on the right side of the steering column. We'll then use our tweezers to line it up so that it's straight up and down on the column. 
Yeah, I definitely think 1.8 would be a better fit. We're going to repeat that process with the turn signal stock. We're going to dip it in some CA glue and then position it on the steering column. You want to position it to make sure that the angle points towards the driver. Next, we're going to add some CA glue to the tip of our collet and we're going to glue that into the steering column. And finally, we will glue our steering wheel into place. For that little bit of extra detail, we're going to add some Tamiya panel liner to the steering wheel mounts. And then we'll glue our steering column into place on the dashboard. Next, we're going to do some detail painting, and not to be outdone on my own tip by my buddy Chris, I have also gone and gotten a 0.2 millimeter mechanical pencil. We're going to dip the lead of the pencil into some Vallejo silver paint, and we're just going to come in and tap some of these buttons in for things like the radio. Now you're probably saying to yourself, Justin, you just glued on the steering column a second ago, and you're absolutely right. This footage is completely out of order, but I kind of wanted the footages to go together with all the detail painting and bare metal folding in one section and the dash and the steering column in the other so this was detail painted before I glued the steering column in. Also got a little carried away with the silver paint so we're coming back in with some Mr. Surfacer 1500 black primer and we're just going to come in and clean up the bottom of the dash under those buttons. Using a 0.3 millimeter pencil, we're going to do the same thing on the door cards, picking out some details like the little triangle logo, which was called a Fratzog. As well as all these little rivets or buttons that run along the bottom of the door card. We're going to switch to the 0.3 millimeter mechanical pencil to pick up this little button or lock on the center console. We're going to use the mechanical pencil as well to paint this trim along the side of the wood grain. You could use a brush for this, but a brush is going to flex and can cause uneven lines. It can even make a mess if it flexes and gets onto the wood surface. The mechanical pencil, being a hard edge, makes a perfect clean line. It takes a little longer as you do have to keep re-adding paint to the pencil, but I think the results are worth it. Honestly, the mechanical pencil is probably one of the best tips I ever picked up watching modeling YouTube. For the interior door handles and the ashtray in the back, we're going to add in some bare metal foil. We're just going to cut off some small pieces and apply it to the door cards. We'll then burnish it down with a small Tamiya cotton bud and a toothpick. Then using a brand new blade in our scalpel, we're going to cut around the edges of the door handle. and then we'll carefully remove the excess foil. After that, we're gonna give it one more quick burnish to make sure the foil is down nice and smooth. And we're done. Since we have these nice deep recesses here, we're gonna go ahead and add some Tamiya panel liner to give us a little bit more distinction, just give us a little bit more detail here. And we'll clean that up with a cotton bud with some odorless mineral spirits. The 
And now we're going to add in our window cranks. The long set are for the door cards, the short set are for the back seat area, and I've printed up several spares. We're going to snap one of the window cranks off and set it into place into the hole we drilled in the door card. And then we're going to glue it in from the back side. And before the glue has a chance to set, we're going to get our window crank positioned where we want it. Our very last step is going to be to add just a little bit of Vallejo Violet to the very tip for the handle of the window crank. This will differentiate the handle from the chrome arm. Using the short window cranks, we're going to repeat that process for the back seat window cranks. Slide the window crank into position, and we're going to glue it from the outside. Position the window crank where we want it. and paint the tip of the handle. We are almost done detail painting. There is a little orange warning light down here on the dash. We're going to hit this with about three coats of the Tamiya Clear Acrylic Orange. And there we go. Flocking. You guys have seen me do flocking multiple times. I have two separate tutorials dedicated specifically to doing carpets, one with flocking and one with embossing powder, which are the exact same processes on both. And this video is already going crazy long, so I don't really want to get into too much detail on the flocking. There are, however, two changes to my flocking in this video. One, I have finally run out of that acrylic Tamiya Clear that I've been using for flocking. This time I'm trying some Elmer's glue thinned with some water. I don't really know the ratio, I just added enough so that the glue would flow off of an old paintbrush and lay down smooth. So using that old paintbrush, we're just going to add in some glue. We're just going to brush it in exactly where we want it. So for here, we're going to brush it into all the floor and along the sides of the center console, as well as that back and the front of the center console. I am going to leave a space where I want to glue my seats in as the seats will stick better to bare plastic than it will over the flocking. When done, you just wash the brush in some warm soapy water and it's clean. And two, someone recently watching one of those flocking videos suggested rather than flocking over a white sheet of paper like I normally do, he flocks inside a large freezer bag. Now I have to say it was a little cumbersome at first with my big ol' hands inside this bag, but I have pretty much no flocking mess on my desk at all, and getting the flocking back into the original container was as simple as cutting the corner off the freezer bag and using it as a funnel to funnel the flocking back into its original container. Now it's time to start working on our seats. This time we're going to use the seat belt set from Mr. Model. I think the photo etch is a little out of scale, but I did find it was a lot easier to thread the 2mm or 1 16th inch ribbon through this than the typical model car garage set. People say to use a hard glass surface to cut the photo etch off the fret, and what I'm using here is a glass bathroom tile I picked up for like 3 bucks at Home Depot. I've seen glass cutting mats going for $15, $20, $30, some are even over $50 on Amazon and hobby shops. This little $3 bathroom tile does a perfect job and takes up very little desk space. We're going to cut the photo etch pieces off the fret and I'm using my Zuron PE shears to cut off the fret nubs. Next we need to bend the sides of the back part over. We're using the Trumpeter PE bending tool. For these buckle parts, I found that it works best to use the side over here, and I tighten it down, but just enough so that it holds, but it's still loose enough that it lets the PE barely slide out when I press it down. Once we have both sides bent at a 90, we'll just come back in with some tweezers and finish bending it over flat.
Now we want to run our ribbon through the front of the top of the buckle. It's easier if you cut the ribbon at an angle with a sharp narrow point. Then we're going to run it through the side of the back that has our folded bits. This way when we add our CA glue to the center we can line it up and press them together and it forms the buckle with the appearance of a space for the latch. We'll then add some CA glue to the ribbon right at the back of the buckle. We'll fold the ribbon over and trim off the excess. For the latch, we just want to run our ribbon through the opening, add a little CA, fold the ribbon over, and again just trim off the excess. A cool tip I learned from Ruben Devia, who runs Big Roo's Fun Factory Group on Facebook, to paint the detail on Photo Etch, use a permanent marker instead of paint. Once it dries, come back with a cotton bud. He uses Ronsonol lighter fluid. I use IPA because I don't have lighter fluid. Get the cotton bud wet, dry it off, and then just gently rub the surface of the photo etch. This will remove the marker from the top surface, leaving the color down in the engraved portion. Now we're gonna glue the belts to the seats. After trimming the belt down, we wanna add a little glue and press the belt into place. We then want to add some glue to this edge on the seat and press the belt down so that it follows the surface of the seat as if gravity is weighing it down rather than just letting it float in midair. Seatbelts never really run in perfect straight lines. So I like to add another tiny little drop of glue to the end of the belt and press it down somewhere in a way that causes the belt to bend or wrinkle and look more natural. We'll repeat the process, gluing down the other side, and remember the buckle side always goes to the center of the car. So when you do the other seat, switch sides with the buckle and the latch. Another awesome thing about these seats from Black Box STL is with the base and the back for the back seat being separate, we can glue the seat belts in so they run under the seat back like they would in a real car. Now with the belts in place, it's time to install the seats in the interior tub. We'll start by adding some glue to the seat base portion of the interior tub. Next, we want to add the printed seat base, and before it can set, we're going to add the back without any glue, just to get the seat base positioned so they sit correctly. We'll then hold it until it sits. Then, we can remove the seat back, add our glue to the back wall, and secure the seat back in place on the back wall of the interior. With the back seat in, we can then glue in our front seats and remember to place the buckles to the inside. There are some seat bases from Black Box for these seats, but I felt they lifted the seat up just a little too much, so we're gonna skip those. From here we want to add in the door cards. We're going to add some CA glue to the bottom and top of the mounting slots in the tub and then we can slide the door cards into place.
Now we're going to glue in the dashboard in place by adding some CA glue to the two mounting tabs. Now there is no positive locating points for this dashboard and the directions are really vague. I found you want to place the dash back right up against the door carts. If you install it forward towards the front of the tub, it will interfere with the body and glass. In my rush to finish, I messed up and I forgot to glue in the pistol grip shifter. Now, gluing this in with the dash already in place was a pain in the rear end and it actually took several tries to get it incorrectly in place, but we did manage to get it eventually. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up for this video. We're getting kind of close to the end of the build, to be honest with you. I would like to get it done in one more video, but I really think we're looking at two. From here, we need to get the glass in and get the body, interior, and the chassis made together. After that, we can start knocking out the rest of the engine bay, so, you know, your battery, radiator, ignition coil, stuff like that. Once we have the engine bay taken care of, it's just a matter of getting all the exterior stuff wrapped up. There's some decals to do, you know, license plates, bumpers, lights, turn signals, you know, all that. And then this one's going to be wrapped up. Gotta be honest, I'm about ready for this one to be over. I'm enjoying the build and, you know, I'm liking the way it's going. We've been on this one for a really long time. I would like to go ahead and get this knocked out and get to started on the buddy build with Chris. I know he's got a Chevelle that he's working on, I believe, and he's about got that knocked out as well. So if I can get this done soon, we can get started on that buddy build. As always, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and building with me, and I appreciate you watching, and I will catch you guys on the next one.